My name is David Malin, and this is CS50. 77% of the people around you here in this room have no prior experience, and that was the same way last year with your 494 predecessors, all of whom accomplished the sorts of things that you saw depicted in those screens there. There's a lot of misconceptions about computer science that it is uh, dominated by folks with their heads down at computer terminals, toiling away, completely antisocial uh, reputation that it is dominated by men and not so much women. And yet these are things that are changing. In fact, last year alone, we had a record number of women in Computer Science 50, up to 37%, almost 40. And I don't doubt before long that we will be at 50-50, perhaps even this year here too. And realize too, that if you're thinking, what the hell am I doing in a computer science class? Class, realize that same emotion is probably going on in maybe 77% of the people to your left or to your right today. But indeed, there's a whole gamut of comfort levels that we have in this course, and these are statistics that are consistent throughout the years. Last year, 46% of the students in this course declared themselves as being among those less comfortable. There's no precise definition for that, but you kind of know it if you're in that bucket, and perhaps some of you have already just slapped that label on yourselves. We have last year 42% of the students in the class being somewhere in between less comfortable and more comfortable, with 12% of the class being those types who may very well have been programming since they were 10 years old or who took AP computer science but we have all sorts of demographics in the class and as you'll see today and on Friday there are a number of ways in which all students in this class can approach it and ultimately succeed as in what that is imagery there. computer and science? We've started this class in recent years with a little demo involving tearing a phone book and you might have heard about this sort of thing before and it's a little hard to keep doing the same bit even though it might very well send very compelling we think pedagogical message, but I found a huge stack of phone books in Maxwell Dork in the computer science building this year, so I thought we might as well do justice to last year's phone book by actually having some of our own team members here answer a question of this form. So a phone book of this size has you know, some 1,000 pages in it. And this is a fairly tedious problem to solve if you're looking for something very small, a needle in a haystack, so to speak. And so if you're looking for, let's suppose these are not so much yellow pages, but white pages with people's names in them, someone like Mike Smith. Well, you could certainly start at the beginning and turn to the next page, and you could see that you're on the A's. You can see that you're on the B's and the C's and the so forth. And my God, some 600, 700 pages later, we might happen across Mike Smith. But if we could perhaps have about every third TF and CA here stand up, perhaps we can do something a little more compelling than that and send home the first such message of the day as to what it actually means to do computer science and to solve problems, as we say in the course catalog description, more efficiently and more effectively. Those TFs and CAs who now have handbooks, uh, phone books in their hands, if you could please stand up. And let's see if we can have the audience here, too, answer a bit of a, here we are. Uh, let's see, if you want to just keep passing these down, otherwise this is going to take all day. Why don't we have each of these guys solve this in what's probably a much more intuitive way. I'll hang on to one for myself. And of course, anyone from the audience probably now can point out that my algorithm, my procedure that I proposed a moment ago, starting at the beginning and turning to the right, turning to the right, might very well be correct. And indeed, it is correct, but it's kind of stupid, right? Because clearly, we can do better than this. So anyone in the audience, what would a reasonable human being do to find Mike Smith in a phone book of this size? So tear, <laughs> tear it in half. <laughs> so we'll get there. <laughs> so you look roughly in the middle, right? You sort of haphazardly pull it on into the inside. So if our volunteers here standing with phone books could do exactly that, odds are, Matt, you ended up at what letter in the alphabet? M. M, indeed, which makes sense because it's roughly in the middle of the alphabet. And so Mike Smith is now clearly to the right. So perhaps our TFs and CAs could demonstrate exactly how we can chop this problem in half now. <laughs> <laughs> most, perhaps most of our staff can demonstrate this. <laughs> So now we've got a problem that's half as big, right? Now we have the M's through the Z's, and so we might dive in again. And so the staff might split the phone book in two yet again. And now we've gone from 1,000 pages to 500. We're about to go now instead to 250. So if you'd like to iterate again here and tear. 
So now we're down to just 250 pages. And if you guys want to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat after just a few tearings of this, only around 10, in fact, should they finally reach just a single page. And on that page should ideally, if they were paying attention to the pages that they were tearing, be someone. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> Would be Mike Smith. <laughs> so thanks to our team here. These are just a few of the faces you'll meet over the course of the semester. Um, you're welcome to sit here the entire lecture. That's fine. Um, but in the moment, we'll need just two of our team. Um, so what did this really do for us? Well, we went from a problem of size, again, 1,000, down to a problem of size 500 to 250. And this is a very powerful thing. We're not just taking one page at a time, but rather we're taking huge, non-trivial bites of this problem out at any given time. So what does this actually mean? Well, let's consider another example. And let me zoom. Whoops, let me zoom ahead to an algorithm here so that we can get the juices flowing among the audience here as well. So every year it's a real pain to do attendance in a room of this size, and it would take me forever. Much like it would take me forever to find Mike in this phone book, I could start sort of like your grade school teacher would and do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and finally we'd get up to n, the total number of students in the room. Now what's a modification to that algorithm that you probably learned, say, in middle school or in high school? How could we speed up that algorithm very easily, very mindlessly? Yeah, count by twos, right? Instead of doing one, two, three, I'm pretty good at counting even numbers, so I can do two, four, six, eight, and so forth. And so if we were to plot this just very simply on a chart, if I said that my original algorithm was just counting one at a time and there's n students in the room, well, that algorithm's going to take n steps, n seconds, n minutes, n operations, whatever the unit of measure is. But if I start counting in twos, well, I can double the speed of this algorithm, and that's pretty good, but my god, it feels like there's room for opportunity here at the right-hand side. And though I'm jumping around and spoiling some of the imagery, let's see if we can't paint this picture as a group as to how much faster we can count everyone in this room than I could. So if you would humor us, the staff of 50, if everyone in this room could now stand up and think to yourself the number one. Go ahead now and execute step two. Pair off with someone near you, add your numbers together, and just one of you should sit down. It's at this point where the demonstration starts to get a little awkward. It's either the people get far away or the arithmetic gets difficult. How many folks do we still see, have standing? I see one, two at, at the top, three, two, you two up to top can pair up, you three up top can pair off. Anyone else down here still standing? You two? What, what's your number here? 52 plus, 52 plus 91, and what do we have in the uh, balcony? 119 total, or just you? One seventy-two. Anyone else still standing? Oh, okay, yeah. One fifty-nine. Uh oh. I didn't hit plus. Now we're up to 17,000. <laughs> Anyone else? I'm going to fake the rest of this. 45, which puts us at 18,000. <laughs> and the total should indeed be, did our teaching staff come? 570. 570. So plus, wait, plus? 121? OK. So the, the preface for this demonstration historically is that this algorithm tends not to work so well in reality. But there, if you consider it on a theoretical level, how much faster that could, how much faster that should have gone, well, indeed, if I were still counting like this and there were, let's say, 500 people in this room, my hand would have had to point at 500 people individually, or better yet, maybe 250 total iterations. But how about you all here? There's 500 people in the room, but on every iteration of this algorithm, this procedure, this program, call it whatever 
whatever you want, half of you are sitting down. So it's much like the same phone book example 500, 250, 125, and so forth. And so that begs the question how many times can you divide a room full of 500 people in half? Well, feels like it's only around nine. If you do out the math and you kind of ignore rounding errors and so forth, you'll get down to a single lonely, awkward volunteer standing in the middle of the room, ideally containing. That number. And I simply facilitated here by merging some of these numbers to get together. And that's a powerful thing because if we go back now to where we started, counting sort of like in grade school, and then we upgraded to twosies in middle school, but now we have something fundamentally more powerful, and that's this notion of logarithmic. Growth as opposed to something linear. Linear implying the straight lines there, logarithmic. This is sort of the end game when trying to implement something well. And that will be a theme of this course. Not just getting something to work, because, right, I could find Mike Smith the old fashioned way, but it's not slow. It's not efficient. I'm going to go use some other website. I'm going to go use some other program that performs better and solves problems more efficiently for me. Well, the other thing about computers is that they're not all that.、Uh, Actually, I did have one snippet here. Let me pull this back. Wimbledon. So, you might be familiar with the notion of、uh, tennis and these tournaments that happen each year. And in Wimbledon, we have some, what is it, 128 people participating in a given tournament. And that tournament actually goes fairly rapidly because when you're playing tennis, of course, you're playing against another person. And so, every time a game is played, and if you're assuming single elimination, you get to have and have and have and have the number of players participating until you have, ideally, just one winner at the end of the game. Game. But imagine now how we can apply this idea of divide and conquer, taking a problem and splitting it in half, and then in half, and then in half, whereby we're not doing anything new and different each time. We're doing the same darn thing again and again, but the problem is rapidly approaching the solution, just one. So I looked it up on Wikipedia earlier today, and there's about 7 billion people on Earth right now. Well, you know what's a pretty powerful thing? We could actually have a worldwide tennis tournament where all seven Billion, maybe let's even round up to 8 billion people could participate. And how many rounds would that actually take? Well, how many times can you divide roughly 8 billion people in half? Well, you go from 8 to 4, 4 to 2, 2 to 1, 1 to a half billion, and so forth. Well, you know what? We could knock off this global Wimbledon tournament after just 33 rounds of play. Now, admittedly, we'd need a whole lot of tennis courts to be doing this all in parallel and simultaneously, but that's the power of actually thinking through and coming up with algorithms that are much more、uh, elegant and efficient than what might otherwise be obvious. The problem, though, is that computers. Need to be told what to do. And we've all gotten frustrated by computers when they don't behave as expected. And that's usually not even your fault, but the fault of some programmer who made some mistake, who didn't anticipate some condition or made some assumptions that the user then kind of flaunted. Well, what's an example? Well, if you look up most any Cooking book. Well, a cooking book will typically start with a recipe in step one, something like put egg in bowl. Well, here's a bowl, here's an egg. It's kind of assuming a few things. That's not, in fact, what the author intended. So we need to be more precise, right? We need to make, but we cannot make so many assumptions. If we want the computer, if we want the cook to do what we want him or her to do, we need to be more accurate and we need to think about how best to express those things. Now, you've probably not had the fun of filling out your own tax forms, but by contrast, the world of federal taxes is very much the opposite. You get these crazy worksheets that are now available in PDF form, or you can use software like Turbo. Turbo tax and the like, but if you just glance at this sort of thing, you'll see that it's ever so precise. For instance, it asks you to check a box and input a number in row five, in row six, in row seven, and then it explicitly says in row nine, add lines five through eight. In other words, the process of taxes is actually, though overwhelming, much more precise. It doesn't just say add up what you earned this year and let us know. Right? It's much more precise than that. So perhaps we could do something like that along the lines of. Something more familiar and less daunting than taxes. In a moment, I'm going to go ahead and.